I'm now very happy to introduce Leka, Leka Rezhniki. He's the secretary, and in U.S. terms, that's really the chief operating officer of the Kosovo Israeli Friendship Association, an organization founded by his late uh, grandfather, Mustafa Rezhniki, to document the Kosovo Albanian rescue of Jews during the Holocaust. Leka is the great grandson of Arslan Rezhniki, the first Kosovo Albanian recognized by Yad Vashem posthumously as a righteous among the nations. With the passing of Lekha's grandfather in 2008, Lekha has expanded the Kosovo Israel Friendship Association's effort to bring international attention to the still little known Albanian rescue in Kosovo through a traveling exhibition. Today's showing as I think Amy pointed out earlier, is the first time that Leka is presenting the exhibit in the United States. Our Albanian American Foundation has pr been privileged to know his grandfather and to work with Leka for the past decade. Please give a very warm welcome to a very committed and remarkable individual. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank everybody that came today, and especially I would like to thank Mr. Joe Diogardi and his wife, Shirley Clois Diogardi, Mr. Ron Rettner and his lovely wife, Karen, for making possible everything, Dara, Amy, Rabbi, and everybody else for providing me this great opportunity to have a presentation in this honored auditorium. My presentation is entitled, Uncovering a Hidden History and legacy, the Kosovo Albanian rescue of Jews during the Holocaust. As it was mentioned, in 1990, when Albania's last communist dictator, Ramiz Alia, turned over to then Congressman Tom Lantos and former Congressman Jody Agardi previously unseen archives about the unique role that Albania had played in saving every Jew who either lived in or sought asylum there during World War II, a potentially lost part of Holocaust history was brought to light. With the authentication of the archives by Yad Vashem a year later, the process of uncovering and documenting Albania's saving role ensued, a process that in the intervening years has encompassed oral history, interviews, and video documentation in the United States, the Balkans, and Israel. The still largely unrecorded dimension of this story is the role that Albanians outside the sovereign nation of Albania in Nazi-occupied Kosovo in particular played in the rescue. As in Albania, this information was available in records for a half a century, but it was hidden by communist forces in Albania and the former Yugoslavia in the post-war era. In Kosovo, the suppression of this information also intersected with a century of Slavic domination over the Albanian majority population and the misrepresentation of their history and culture. Memories of first-hand experiences, photographs, artifacts, and some written records were passed down through private channels of families and trusted friends and are only now being recorded for posterity. Only in the mid of 2000s did the effort begin in an orchestrated way to reconstruct through oral history the essential role that Kosovo Albanians played in hiding Jews from the Nazis and securing their safe passage to Albania. Kosovo, illegally annexed by Serbia at the end of World War I, was conquered by the German Nazis in April 1941, along with the rest of Yugoslavia. After Yugoslavia's capitulation to Hitler's forces, most of Kosovo, with its Albanian majority population, was reunited briefly with Albania, which had been under the control of the Italian fascists since April 1939. Cambridge University professor Noel Malcolm explained this development in his Kosovo A Short History. Quote, at a meeting of the Italian and German foreign ministers in Vienna on April 21, it was agreed that the largest part of this Albanian inhabited territory, Kosovo, should be put under Italian control and joined to Albania in order to prevent Albanian ethnic irredentism from becoming the driving force of an anti-German resistance. In other words, the Nazis wanted to pacify Kosovo Albanians by appearing to free them from a long history of Serbian oppression. In September 1943, Italy surrendered to Nazi Germany and German troops invaded Albania. 
Henceforth, the Nazis occupied all of Kosovo and Albania. The political situation in Kosovo from 1943 to the end of the war was extremely complex and dangerous, one in which Kosovar Albanians had to contend with the occupying German army and the infamous SS on the one hand, and on the other, the Serbian nationalists who were collaborating with the Nazis and who had oppressed Albanians for generations. As a result, Jews in Kosovo, who had resided there since the 15th century, were in great jeopardy, and their Kosovar Albanian rescuers acted on their behalf at enormous personal risk. Like Albanians inside the sovereign nation of Albania, Kosovars acted out of the same moral code in rescuing Jews during World War II that had sustained Albanians for thousands of years. At its core was a percept of Besa, requiring the uncompromising protection of those in need and a long history of interreligious harmony. One of the first recorded rescues of Jews in Kosovo occurred in Pristina, the country's capital, when Serbian authorities complied with Nazi demands to jail 60 Jewish men and prepare them for transport to the extermination camp in Auschwitz, Poland. Spiro Lito, an Albanian doctor who worked at the hospital in Pristina, enlisted the city's mayor to support his rush to save these men. He took all of the hospital's physicians to visit the Jewish prisoners and then declared to the Nazis that the prisoners had contracted typhus and to prevent a widespread epidemic had to be transported immediately to hospitals in Albania. The men were quickly dispatched to Berat, Albania, where Albanian authorities gave them false documents to hide their Jewish identities and then sent them into safe hiding in rural Albanian villages. The issue of whether Kosovo Albanians collaborated with their Nazi occupiers has been the subject of much debate. Although some collaboration took place, as Noel Malcolm has explained, quote, the driving force was neither ideological sympathy with fascism or Nazism, nor any interest in the wider war aims of the Axis powers, but simply the desire of many Albanians to seize the opportunity offered by the collapse of Yugoslavia to gain more power over their own territory and reverse the colonizing and Slavicizing policies of the previous two decades." End of quote. For the same reason, some Kosovars were attracted to communism. The Yugoslav Communist Partisans, under General Marshal Tito, agreed at two conferences in Albania in 1944 to make Kosovo independent as soon as the Nazis were defeated. But they reneged on their promises. After the Nazis withdrew, Tito would declare in 1945 the new political geography and constitution of Yugoslavia, which would place five republics and two provinces, Kosovo and Vojvodina, under Serbia. The majority of Kosovar Albanians opposed Nazism and many more than have been documented thus far acted to free Jews. My great-grandfather, Arslan Reznici, was one of the leading members of the Nazi resistance in Kosovo who devoted six years of his life to saving Jews. My grandfather, Mustafa Reznici, an adolescent during the war, assisted him and for the rest of his life he preserved and carried on the history of our family's role and that of other Kosovar Albanians in rescuing Jews during the Holocaust. The narrative of Kosovo Albanian resistance to the Nazis actually begins with my great grandfather Arslan Reznici. He was a merchant in Jakova, in Kosovo, who later moved to live and work in the city of Dechan. As far back as 1931, he made a living as a trader in Albania, Macedonia, Turkey, and Greece, and his principal colleagues were Jews from Skopje, Macedonia, and Thessaloniki, Greece. Chief among them were David, and, uh, David Cohen and Rafael Nathan. In 1939, on the eve of World War II, when their lives were clearly at risk with the rise of Nazism in Europe, David Cohen, Rafael Nathan, and another colleague, Solomon Comforti, reached out to my great-grandfather for help. They asked to come and live with our family in Dechan if we could provide them with accommodation and security. My great-grandfather brought Cohen, Nathan, and Comforti and their families into his home in 1940. Later, after Yugoslavia capitulated to the Nazis in 1941, my grandfather continued to hide them and eventually helped them flee to Albania. Bearing in mind the fact that our family owned a lot of land but nevertheless had a modest home, my great-grandfather made an agreement with Rafael Nathan, David Cohen, and Solomon Conforti to build a new stone house next to his own. The house was to accommodate their immediate families and closest relatives and later many other Jews seeking refugee. 
Not only did my great grandfather shelter and protect these families, but he even hired a professor, Bechirka Strati, to come to the house clandestinely to teach their children. In early 1941, three members of the Reznici family died from an epidemic of typhus that broke out in Kosovo. My grandfather, Mustafa Reznici, was among those who contracted the disease. Coincidentally, that March, a Jewish physician, Haima Bravanel, was mobilized in Skopje, Macedonia, in a Yugoslav army unit. Traveling by train to Peja, a town in west of Kosovo, Dr. Abravanel ran into Solomon Conforti, also a Jew from Skopje. Conforti immediately informed my great-grandfather about the presence of Dr. Abravanel in Kosovo and the prospect of his treating his son, Mustafa. Conforti convinced Abravanel to accompany him to Dechan to treat my grandfather, who at that time was under the care of two Serb doctors who thought that they, he was suffering from malaria. When Dr. Abravanel arrived in Dechan, he quickly discovered that my grandfather had typhus and fortunately was able to save his life. Mustafa, who would go on to assist his father in the rescue of Jews, would pass the family story down to his son Adnan and to me, Adnan's son. Later, when Dr. Abravanel and his army unit were captured by the Germans in Kosovo, my great-grandfather went looking for him, found him, and helped return him to safety in our family home in Dechan. During the five months that he spent there, Dr. Abravanel treated the local Albanian population and refused to take any recompense for his services, saying that he lived and ate for free at the home of Arslan Reznici, and therefore there was no need to pay him. In time, Dr. Abravanel wanted to return to his wife Berta and family in Skopje, and my great-grandfather accompanied him on the return trip to Macedonia. As word spread about the Reznici family sanctuary, other Jewish families approached our family for help, and soon 40 families from Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Serbia were sheltered in our house, sometimes for days, often for months, until my family was able to organize safe passage for them to Albania. To camouflage their presence, all of the Jewish families were given traditional Albanian clothes to wear. The residents of Dechan knew that our son and his wife, my great-grandmother Fatima Reznici, were harboring Jews, but none of them ever informed the Nazi police patrolling the area. According to a journalist, Ibrahim Kadriou, quote, while the Nazis were looking everywhere for Jews and had already imprisoned 40 Jewish families in Mitrovica, 120 Jews in Pristina and 30 in Prizren, the Reznici house served as a safe shelter and transfer point for Jews, end of quote. The transport of these families to Albania, as well as uh, that of the Conforti, Natan, and Coam families, all of which took place in 1943, was done with the help of my great-grandfather's Kosovar Albanian colleagues, Halim Spahiu, a merchant with contacts in the Albanian Chamber of Commerce, and Hassan Rey Mazzarza. Many of the Jewish families were also sent on to Italy with the additional help of Pashuk Biba, a merchant, whose brother Kolya was Albanian's Minister of the Interior. My great-grandfather and his colleagues were able to use their trading routes and contacts in the Balkans to secure safe passage for hundreds of Jews. To mention, I would like to mention one thing. There were two ways for uh, helping and send, transporting Jews from Kosovo to Albania, either by the main road from Kosovo to Albania, which would be by crossing the border, either by the mountains. But when it was possible to to, to uh, to, to, to travel by uh, the main road, it was possible only by providing false documents. And the gentleman, Ari Falichka, whose son Agim is today with us, and he is also going to say a few words, uh, he provided the false documents as he was the secretary of the municipality of Dechan, in which he used his power to provide the false IDs in which he registered Jews that were coming as Bosnians, as mainly the Jews in the Balkans were speaking Serbo-Croatian language. They didn't know Albanian, so it was the easiest way to register them as Bosnians, and then they could go by the main road. And when that was not possible because of security, then they would be sent by the mountains. Dr. Abravanel survived the war working as a doctor in Manastir, the old city of Skopje, Macedonia, and my family kept in touch with him over the years. However, in 1963, tragedy struck when Skopje was hit by an earthquake killing his daughter Reina and her husband, Dr. Salvatore Levi. 
My great-grandparents and grandfather immediately left for Skopje to attend the funeral and spend time with Dr. Bravanel and his wife Berta. As it turned out, the tragedy was too much for them to bear, and they told my family that they were planning to immigrate to Israel. Out of gratitude to my family for saving them during the war, the Abravanels offered their house to my great-grandparents. But they would not accept the offer and instead suggested that the Abravanels donate their home to the Red Cross. This would be their last meeting. Between 1943 and 1960, my family no longer had direct contact with the most of the Jewish families that it had saved. Nevertheless, through Sami Mizrahi in Skopje, Macedonia, my family managed to get some information about the fate of the Cohen, Comforti, and Natam families. In 1960, Solomon Comforti came to visit my family, which had since moved to a new house in Pristina on a one-day visit from Greece. Solomon had a lovely reunion with my great-grandparents, Arslan and Fatima, who had traveled from Dechan for the occasion, my grandmother, Sutkia, and other Reznici family members. At the request of Solomon Conforti, my family also invited Becir Kastrati, the teacher who had taught their daughters while they were in hiding. At the end of October 2007, my grandfather Mustafa traveled to Israel to attend the recognition at Yad Vashem of the saving role that Albanians had played during the Holocaust. In Jerusalem, he had an emotional reunion with Rachel Shelley, Levi Drummer, the granddaughter of Dr. Haima Bravanel, who had saved his life as a teenager during the war. He told me that as soon as he and Shelley met, they embraced. They could not hold back their tears, and they spent an evening sharing their memories. Shelley told my grandfather about Haim and Berta's lives later years in Israel. Two years earlier, in, in 2005, my grandfather and Janguilia Ilyazi co-founded the Dr. Haim Abravanel Kosova Israel Friendship Association in Pristina. I am the organization's secretary. We have been able to identify at least 30 families in Kosovo that provided shelter and safe passage for Jews. On March 17, 2009, Yad Vashem recognized Arslan Reznici and his family for their saving role during the Holocaust, the first Kosovar Albanian to receive the award Righteous Among Nations. Mustafa Reznici accepted the award in Kosovo's capital, Pristina, on behalf of his father. Two months later, on May 28, 2009, Mustafa died at the age of 85. My grandfather's experience during the Holocaust was one of the most formative in his life, and I will always remember his words about the role that his family played in saving Jews. No matter what the risk is to you and your family, you may never betray your promised word, Besa. Thank you very much.